Hello everyone, I'm Tanya Rivero. Thank you for joining us. There is more hope on the way in the nation's fight against COVID-19. The FDA could approve a second vaccine, Moderna's candidate, for emergency use today. An advisory panel recommended it be authorized last night. It would come one week after those same scientists endorsed Pfizer's vaccine. That is the vaccine Vice President Mike Pence received his first dose of this morning. Second Lady Karen Pence and Surgeon General Jerome Adams were also vaccinated during the televised event. The Trump administration is trying to boost confidence about the vaccine's safety. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi also received her first shot today. So far, more than 17 million Americans have tested positive for the coronavirus. And as cases continue to surge to historic levels, hospitals are running out of space to treat patients. CBS News lead national correspondent David Begno has the latest. It's a healthy 33-year-old, huh? Yes, sir. Right now, there is not a single available ICU bed at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. As the unrelenting crush of COVID patients is simply pushing staff to their limits. Listen to this nurse. We're at the point where we no longer could take care of them. The wait is a lot longer. You know, the patients are really sick. With no beds inside, patients are now being triaged and treated in tents outside. And then there are the frontline workers, like Albert Almador. He is a custodian at Arrowhead. Every day, wrapped head to toe in PPE, he cleans and cares for the rooms that house the COVID patients. I wonder what you think when you're in there cleaning and the patient is there. I pray for the patients as I clean. But for hospitals like Arrowhead, there is more help on the way in the form of a second vaccine, this time from Moderna. Yesterday, the FDA's independent panel on vaccines endorsed the Moderna vaccine for emergency use. Dr. Eric Rubin is a member of that group. What should people take away from the panel's nearly unanimous yes? I think the important message is that the panelists felt very confident in the vaccine. And these are going to be some of the first people in line to get the vaccine themselves and give it to their families. You know, all week we have noticed enthusiasm from frontline workers who were either giving the Pfizer vaccine to their colleagues or receiving it. It was like you were giving them a shot of gold. They were just so excited about it. For this nurse in Lafayette, Louisiana, it was giving the vaccine that was the real gift. On Thursday, she was able to vaccinate the oncologist that she says helped save her life when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. He saved my life 20 years ago, and me giving him this injection today, I hopefully could help save his. For me to be able to sit with the man who soothed me, comforted me, gave me hope, and here I had in my hands hope for him. And that Louisiana nurse is my mother, Sid Begno. She's a retired registered nurse who now works part time looking after the health and safety of other frontline workers. I'm so incredibly proud of her because I know that moment was a giving back type of thing in terms of giving the shot, but it was also paying it forward as a former patient because all of it was a real full circle moment for her. David Begno, CBS News, San Bernardino, California. And joining me now is Dr. Annette Raboli. She's a professor of medicine and dean of the Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. Dr. Raboli, welcome. Great to have you with us. So the FDA panel gave a nearly unanimous recommendation for emergency use of Moderna's vaccine. What are the main differences between Pfizer's vaccine and Moderna's, and is one considered superior in any way? So short of a head-to-head -head comparison of the two, based upon the clinical trials that have been done, they appear comparable, both in efficacy, very high, amazing efficacy, and very excellent safety profiles uh, based on the results of these clinical trials that the FDA is acting on for the emergency use authorizations for these drugs. Uh, you would have to compare them, though, in the same clinical trial head-to-head -to, -head to say that they're totally comparable. But I think the medical community considers their efficacy comparable, 94 to 95%, and their safety profiles are comparable. And uh, this is great. And under the initial plans for the emergency use authorization, which is the mechanism to facilitate the availability and use of um, 
medical uh, countermeasures, vaccines, medications, et cetera, during public health emergencies, that, that number had been set at 50%. So coming in with this efficacy in the uh, mid 90s is quite extraordinary. It's, it's an amazing efficacy uh, that, that uh, these vaccine products are showing both Pfizer and Moderna's product. It's very exciting. Um, I'm curious, though, once this second vaccine is approved, could Americans have a choice of which vaccine to take, or will it simply be uh, an issue of the logistical rollout, you know, that the CVS or the Walgreens or the medical office closest to you has one or the other, and that's the one that you get? I think right now it will be pretty much where the, these products are distributed uh, under, you know, mm -hmm. Operation Warp Speed and the distribution plans from the federal government to the state government uh, to various sites. And I think it will come down to that. Eventually, there might be some element of choice. Uh, right now, I think most medical professionals are, are comfortable receiving either product. I know I would be comfortable receiving either one. I think choice of uh, the, the product that a site has is based on their uh, ability to handle the ultra cold that's required for the Pfizer product. It has to be kept at minus 70 degrees until you're ready to uh, reconstitute it and use it. So I think that that is how the distribution uh, has been dictated to the, the various sites. If a site doesn't have the ultra cold refrigeration, they can't handle the Pfizer vaccine. Now, uh, we know that President Trump has not received the vaccine so far. He was hospitalized with coronavirus earlier this year, raising the question about people who've already had it. You know, millions of Americans have already had it and recovered. Do they still need the vaccine? So the short answer is yes, they will still need the vaccine. Uh, generally, uh, what we've learned is that uh, people who have already had infection uh, will have about a 90-day window. It would be very rare within that 90-day or three-month window for someone to get reinfected. So depending upon vaccine availability, most people uh, can wait um, that long. And certainly the recommendation is that if you uh, have received one of the monoclonal antibody products like uh, President Trump received, that uh, you should wait so that it doesn't hamper your own immune response and your own production of antibody. If someone has natural infection, once they've recovered from the natural infection, they really could get the vaccine at any time. Uh, but if they did receive one of these monoclonals or convalescent plasma, they should wait that 90-day window to ensure that they will have a result from their vaccination. That's interesting, though, that you put that 90-day uh, timeline or that, that you know, doctors are beginning to, to look at it as a three-month sort of protection. Does that apply to the vaccine as well? I mean, is that how long the vaccine is presumed to last? Well, no. So right now, we don't know how long the vaccine will last. Um, so, you know, we will be, uh, depending upon uh, the companies that have produced this, uh, to continue studies of how long uh, vaccine-induced immunity lasts. But, it, you know, it seems like it will likely be more than that 90-day window that we talked about from, you know, the biologicals and things like that. So right. More Let's hope so, right? Because that would... Yeah, right. And th <laughs> right. More to come on that. This, this whole um, situation has very much been a learning curve. It has really boosted our knowledge of vaccines, the availability of vaccines, the availability of new medications. A lot has changed, a lot of the early knowledge. I mean, you even think of the way uh, mask use has changed. Now, you know, everyone is wearing masks when this first started. Uh, you know, the masks, including from uh, agencies like the CDC, they weren't advocating universal masking. Now we're all advocating that from a public health standpoint. Right. It's true. We have been learning as we go.
for sure, and a lot still to learn. Well, Dr. Annette Raboli, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you sharing your medical expertise with us.